Hello everyone, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, yes, the topic is the poo-poo, uh, poo-poo, meaning some people push the whatever it is and said canine horror or blind horror. Is that Jewish, not Jewish? Is that something bad or good? And in general, the big question is what Jewish faith has to do with um, the idea of superstition. So before we go to our talk, obviously um, I need to make some points because I look at your faces. We have a large crowd today, which is really wonderful and uh, honor and pleasure. But I assume, maybe I'm wrong, that some of you are hungry. So I want you to know I'm not responsible for the food. And the moment we have a food, you can raise your hand and ask questions while other people are eating, which is fine with me. But to save time, because it's Friday, and uh, I know that Shabbat is very late, um, I want to remind all of you that we have a program coming this um, late afternoon. It's not Shabbos. It's like hour and a half before Shabbos. And I always said to people who recorded and put it on the iTunes or YouTube or whatever it is, put a mark so everyone knows that we're doing that before Shabbos. But the idea is we're going to have electric guitar, acoustic guitar, and next time we have a drummer, and uh, we're going to have a Friday night combining services for children and adults. So I assume I'll not dress the way I'm dressing now. Uh, I have a Billy Joel t-shirt. Uh, I'm not sure if I wear it because it's still upcoming Shabbos. But anyway, that's the upcoming event. So just stay tuned and whenever the food come in, everything will be under control. Um, the subject of Hollywood, as many of you know, not only Walt Disney, but uh, the idea of Mickey Mouse, uh, um, people speaking to uh, certain animals and more, it's not just fun stuff for the children cartoons and things like that. In our perspective in Jewish faith, it's much serious and much deeper. So the question that people ask me, believe it or not, mainly non-Jews, as you know I belong to so many organizations and people constantly ask me those questions. What exactly the Jewish perspective um, when it's come to these superstitious ideas? Is that real? Is that not real? Some examples, um, you go to uh, Kabbalah Center, they have 39 centers worldwide. I don't know if you're aware of, but it's based on my grandfather. My mother's father was Rabbi Brandwine, who was the teacher of the late Rabbi Berg, who invented the Kabbalah Center worldwide. So they basically um, selling not only them but others a red string for people as a protection. How many of you heard about it? Raise your hand. Oh la la. Okay, so is that real? Um, obviously, we will talk about it later, but it's just a small example. Another example is as simple as it sounds, is the mezuzah. You know, every Jewish door, every Jewish home, they have on the door mezuzah. Now you see all of a sudden people have mezuzah, not only at the cars and the elevators. Did you ever heard about it? Car mezuzah? I saw it, I couldn't believe it, but people does that. Elevators mezuzah. You heard about it? Okay, so you see, I'm not making up stories, it's real. Now what is it all about? Why, what exactly people believe? I must share with you a story that just come to my mind. I'm going back to the early 90s. The guy that brought me to America is the late Kentu Bayesian. Kentu Bayesian was not only a great composer in Kentu, but was also a businessman. So one time here in Brooklyn, you know the holy city of Brooklyn? So in Brooklyn, yeah. So in the holy city of Brooklyn, he used to have a car dealership as a side business. And sure enough, when he decided to retire, he sold it to guess whom? Anthony and the other guy both are Italians. So obviously, Chazen Moishe, 
my dear friend, may you rest in peace, he pulled out with his son all the mezuzahs from the business and obviously he took it because, you know, mezuzah can be a 50 or 80 or 100 dollars, just the, the scroll itself. Guess what happened? Another guess. Another guess. You're getting, you're getting close. Okay? Guess what happened? This guy, Anthony, imagine, Italian guy, big guy, knocked at his door almost middle of the night. And he said, hey, why you take those scrolls from the doors? He says, it's Jewish stuff. He says, I don't care. It's a protection for my business. You can't take it. Put it back. And you know what the mafia used to say? If you don't do it, we know where you live. So you have no choice. And he said to him, Anthony, what's going on? He says, this is good. If it's protecting you, it protect me too. Don't take it out. I'm going to kill you. Put it back. So, thank you. So sure enough, he put it back. But what's the story of the mezuzah? You see, so many non-Jews, non-Jews have that mezuzah. We all know that in a mezuzah, is the Shema, is the sentence of believe, O Israel, the Lord is God. And then the first paragraph, Ve'ahavta, you shall love your Lord, your God. What all that has to do with us? What does the mezuzah have to do with us? Obviously, the answer is, well, why we put the mezuzah on the doors? Right, so the Torah said that we should do it, and our understanding from our rabbis is because it's a protection. So can someone explain to me how exactly the protection takes place? How? How? It, explain to me, I'm a kid, six years old, I see it on, you, on the door, and I ask you, Mommy, explain to me how it works. What's the answer? How? How, how the protection takes place? If it's a thieves about to knock your door and break it. How the mezuzah protected you? Passover story? My answer is, in short, every answer you give is right, but the concept is they have the name of God, one of the many names of God, which is the letter Shin, the letter Dalet, and the letter Yud, which is in a Hebrew acronym, is the guardian Shomer, Daltot, the doors of Israel, and we believe by having that on our doorposts, the same as the story of Exodus, is a protection, is a protection for our, whatever it is, for our lives, for our needs, for our uh, yeah, valuables, and things like that. It's a famous belief. Now, let's go the next step. We have, especially in the Jewish Middle Ages, but you can go even earlier, the subject is called emulet, or in Hebrew, kamea. What is emulet? Anyone heard about it? The people carry it in their pocket for protection. I don't do that, but I assume some people know about it, right? So in very short, because we have large crowd, usually I like to hear you out loud, but it's too much, so I'll say it in short. The emulet, the kamea, contain some special name of gods, also name of special entities like angels and, and entities that refer in the book of Ezekiel and others. And it's a belief, again, it's all depend upon our beliefs that by carry it, we have a special protection. Now, you can argue that it's a superstition, that it's crazy, that it's not really in the Jewish faith, but here I'm going to travel with you throughout the Bible. I'm going to give you several examples. And then I would like you to think together with me and tell me what is the real Jewish perspective for the idea of poo poo can I nahar? I would like to start with a simple sentence um, that is written in the Torah. It's just three words, and it's written in the Torah at the middle of the Bible, and it said mechashefa. Mechashefa is almost like a witchcraft. Lote Chaye, should not live. It's like an abomination. And then the Torah said in the book of Leviticus, you shall not create any divination, you shall not talk to the dead, you shall not um, communicate to entities out of this world. 
So the question is, do we believe it? If we don't believe it, so why the Torah needs to mention that? And if we do believe it, what exactly those entities does to us? And why the Torah need to go at length in so many times to give us a warning not to do it? Meaning, if you go on a main street and you see Sister Faye psychic reading, first 10 minutes for $10. Have you ever heard about it? All right, so the question is, is that Meshigas, is that Nances, or Narishkeit, or is something serious? So I would like to share with you an example, fascinating, I think, example, in the book of Genesis, book of Bereshit. Here is a very famous story of Abraham sent his servant Eliezer to search for a kala, to search for a groom for his son Isaac. A bride, sorry, I'm just still have a jet lag. Thank you. At least some people listening to me. Thank you. So, if you can please open the book of Genesis. You know me, I like always constructive criticism. Um, chapter 24, I have different humashim, so I cannot give you the page. Maybe uh, someone can give you the right pages. Uh, Genesis chapter 24. Uh, what page? I need uh, either Jenny or Marilyn. What page is it? Chapter 24. 130? 130. Thank you. I'm not going to read every word. I'm just wanting to share with you the concept. Tell me when you're ready. Because, thank God we are many. Can I know horror? Can I know horror, right? And therefore, you know, we need to do it a little different than usual. So chapter 24, I'm just giving you the synopsis. So you know, sometimes you get the feeling that the rabbi is making up stories. This is real. The Torah said about Abraham that he called upon his servant Eliezer and he said to him, Listen, I'm worried about my son. He study all day, Isaac. I don't know how I find him a wife. It wasn't J-date in those days. It wasn't J-wed. It wasn't... Uh, he was actually the first world matchmaker, Eliezer. Some said the non-Jewish, but anyway, servant of Abraham. So he sent him out and he said, I have a very clear instructions for you how to find the right color, the right potential bride for my son. So Eliezer is told to, to, to torn. He has no clue what to do. So he's standing there with the camels, sentence 12. I try just to translate it lucidly the way I see the Hebrew text. And he said, Almighty God, God of my master Abraham, do me a favor, bring me a sign, give me a signal that I know that this is the Bashar for my boss. Because I have no clue how to find the right bride. So here is the deal, sentence 13. Behold, I am standing here by the spring of water, and the daughters of the town men come out to draw water. You remember those days, they used to have a well and they dig in and they bring water. So I'm going to give you a signal, Lord. If, let it be that when, that the maiden to whom I shall say, please tip over your jar so I may drink, and who replies, drink, and I'll even water your camels, her will you almighty have designated for the, your servant, for Isaac, and may I know through her that you have done kindness with my master. What is this? So you make like a deal with God, right? I'm standing here. I have no clue how to find the right girl for my boss. So therefore, if someone come to me and said, do so and so, and I respond, do and so and so, and she will do so and so, then I know that she is for my boss. Now, the Torah said, sentence 15, 
he's just about to finish his sentence. You see, I'm not making up stories. I brought this book. I asked Eric, thank you, and Jenny, to bring all those books because for some of you, it's like where you get it from. It's in the Torah, right? So it was then when he was just about to finish speaking, and guess what happened? The little girl, suddenly Rebecca, was coming out, right? And they said in uh, sentence 18, exactly the way he said, he ran toward her and he said, let me sip for you please a little water. And she said, drink my Lord. And she gave him and she gave his camel, the, the, the drink, etc., etc. And when these all back and forth and back and forth, by the end, he reports, sentence 42, just give you the abbreviation, and he reports to her father and brother. And he said, I was standing there, I make the certain preconditions, and this is what happened, sentence 45, I was about to finish my, like, my deal with God, my condition, my deal with God, and guess what happened? And Rebecca came out, the jug on her shoulder, and she descended in the spring to draw water, and she gave me to drink, and she gave the camel to drink, and I asked her, who are you? And I gave her the gift. Now, tell me, can I take her or not? And they said, fine, and they took her, and he repeated the story to his master. So all the rabbis jumped on this and said, what's going on? Is that Jewish? Can you do that? Can you say, okay, God, I'm standing there. If it's a black cat cross the street, I'm not going today to synagogue because I saw a black cat cross the street. I'm not going to open the business. You remember the late Nancy Reagan? Okay, I shouldn't say Lush and Horror. So anyway, there are people that take it seriously, you know. This is what happened. It's a sign. It's a sign for God. Here's in the Bible. So obviously the rabbis, you know, two rabbis, five opinions. So you have different views. You have rabbis that said, this happened before giving the Torah. So all these rules we learned wasn't applicable yet. You have others that said, who told you that Eliezer was Jewish? Right? He was servant of Abraham. There are others who said, certain things allow and certain things are not allowed. So you see, I already gave you three opinions. But the truth is, this is not the only case that, um, that uh, the Bible described this type of weird behavior. And I'm just going to show you another one or two examples of things like that within the text. That again, we have to ask ourselves, why is it part of the canon? Why is it part of the Bible? And what's the message? So this is something we're going to read two weeks from now. It's a very famous story. Pay, uh, uh, Book of Numbers, chapter 24. Can someone give us the page? Book of Numbers. You know it by heart. Oh. 90? 903. So this is the story of Balak. Balak, the Torah portion of Balak is the only portion that have no commandments. The portion that contain name of a total non-Jew. Not just that, is a non-Jew that basically tried to curse the Jewish people. But one of the things that happened in this portion is a weird story about donkey communicating with Bilam. And I'm not going here to give you the whole spiel and the whole Megillah and the whole story. You're welcome to read by yourself. But it was a story of Bilam, very wicked person who was hired by Balak, hit the donkey three times and eventually the donkey opened its mouth and said, why are you doing that to me? And it was the angel of God at the front of the donkey. And it was back and forth between the donkey and Bilam. And eventually Bilam wanted to curse, but he gave us a blessing. So the question is, what is this? Obviously we know that Bilam and Balak are not Jewish. But if you pay attention to a song that we recite 
mainly on Friday night by the end of the service. It's called Yigdal. You heard that song? So within that song, there is a line, very fascinating line that said, Lo kam be Israel, in the nation of Israel, we never have someone like Moses. And it means that in our people, the highest prophet was Moses. But among the non-Jews, Bil'am, in some ways, uh, was equivalent to Moses. It means, the rabbis explained to us in the Zohar and other books, that the same way as we have darkness and light, plus and minus, two opposites, the same way that God granted us with the prophecy of Moses, it was the prophecy of Bilam, total evil man that tried to basically use the same mouth of Moses that give blessings to give a curse against the Jewish people and destroy them. So here you see another text that dealing with something very deep and fascinating. The idea that in a Jewish belief there is a possibility of using almost magic, using almost things that it's above the physical, you can call it metaphysical, but something that is not tangible in a way, to create a new phenomenon. Now don't think that that's the only source. You can dig in the story of Jonathan and David, you can dig in further on in the book of Samuel and book of Kings, you see sources of using certain signals, almost like making deals with gods. If this happened, you do this. If that happened, you do that, etc. So we, back to our question, the Jewish faith believe in the black magic, the Jewish faith believe is um, um, those entity, those possibility that things have a power. And this is something very important that we should remember. Many people believe that Jewish faith totally rejected any notion that it's not visible. But the truth is, how do you say it in Yiddish? The MS? The truth is that Jewish text repleted is full of evidence that it was used for all kinds of different things. And what I'm going to do in a very short way to show you again and again and again this pattern. That in one hand, the Torah said several times, you are prohibited to use it, don't use it, don't do that. On the other hand, you see evidence that they keep using something like that. Example, do you all know the story of the beginning of the book of Exodus, how Moses, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush? And then God told him, go and speak to Pharaoh. You remember that story? And then Moses went with Aaron and he tried to create a special magic. You remember that? It was frogs. It was taking his hand and coming out like a snow hand. And the magician of Pharaoh did the same thing. You remember those stories? All kind of things. I can show you. It's in the book of Exodus. What is this? The beauty of that is by the end of the, all of that description, the Torah said that Aharon's staff swallow all the Egyptian staffs. Which means that it's something there, it's something that existed, but somehow the omnipresent, the supernatural power, the Almighty God, the Creator, is able to, in a way, swallow them, overcome those entities. So what we understand so far is, yes, by telling us that it is prohibited, it means that it's existed. By telling us don't do that, it means that you recognize, at least in your subconscious, that there's something there. Now, the next thing is, how exactly the formula works. When you say that this is just the charlatans, and other time you say that that's real, how exactly that magic works? So, here is a very deep discussion. I'm going to give you just the abbreviation of that because I don't know about you, but I'm hungry and I see a lot of food here. There is a book in the early uh, literature of Kabbalah that is called Yetzirah, the book of creation. And in that book, um, 
is a description that if a person using a certain name of God, he can create it a new entities. Example to that is the story of Moses killed the Egyptians. We all know the story, right? Moses went out of Pharaoh, he saw two people fighting, and he said to one of them, why you hit your fellow? And he turned left and right, and he hit that person and he died. You know that story? Oi, vey. Okay, so, book of Exodus chapter 2. I need the help with the pages, please. Chapter 2, book of Exodus. So, sentence 11, it was in those days that Moses grew up and went out to his brethren. He lived in the house of Pharaoh because Pharaoh raised Moses. And observed their brethren, and he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brethren. So, chapter 2, verse what? 321. Thank you. Tell me when everyone is with me, so I'll feel better because otherwise I feel I'm talking to myself. Excellent. So we all the same chapter? Chapter 2, verse 12, 13, 14. So Moses said, I just give you the paraphrase of the text. He says, why are you hitting the other fellow? Right? No, let's go back, I'm sorry. Let's go back to sentence 11. Sentence 11. It happened in those days Moses grew up and went out to his brother and observed the burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brethren. He turned this way and, and he saw that there was no man. So, guess what Moses did? He struck down the Egyptians and hid him in the sand. What do you understand? If you go literally, you said he killed him, but it wasn't guns in those days, right? So many rabbis, if you read the Rashi and other commentary, they said that he used the name of God and he used a certain formula and he killed him by using that formula. Again, take it or leave it. It's just the word the rabbis tells us. So the book of Yetzirah, the book of creation, second century, said that it can create it the same way as they believe that God created the world. Using certain name of God, certain formula can create it a special phenomena. There was a great rabbi by the name of Maharal. Maharal, it was a rabbi in Prague in, in those days, Czechoslovakia, 16th century. And he wrote a book called Be'er Gola. And in that book he said that the whole creation of the world, and he's not the only rabbi who said it, was based on using Hebrew vibration and using certain formula of using Hebrew, 22 Hebrew letters and names to create the current world. Furthermore, the Talmud mentioned that in a few places, and it was the great Rabbi Yehuda Levi, again, great rabbi, some said 12th, 13th century, but anyway, he attributed that to Abraham, saying that using certain formula and certain name can create certain entity. The famous example is the Maharal of Prague who created the Golem. Did you ever heard that name, Golem? Yes. Golem? Okay, so here is, again, religion is based on legend, myth, take it or leave it. But the story goes that this was the great Kabbalist rabbi that was able to take, created an entity almost like a robot, like human, and that golem, that entity was able to help the Jewish people fighting the terrible blood libel that took place in Christian Europe in those years. The uh, Jewish writing, Jewish literature, especially the Yiddish literature, replete with stories about the golem, how good it was and how bad is the ending. But the story goes that this great rabbi created that entity out of using certain names of God. The answer, it was a rabbi, a Sephardic rabbi by the name of Rabbi Chagiz, Mahari Chagiz. He was one of the great Spanish rabbis that, uh, that uh, lived obviously several years ago. But he said 
that the closest we get to the end of the days, the less you see um, um, those phenomena have an effect. But um, I, I want to show with you a good example that is mind-boggling, is puzzling by the Rambam. The Rambam, as you know, was the um, great um, 12th, 13th century uh, physician, philosopher, rabbi, with so many hospitals named after him, Maimonides. In one, on one hand, he was very strong against any form of deviation or superstition. On the other hand, he um, um, contradicted himself by um, using this formula in different time. Um, so, in, in one hand, he said in the special book, it's called The Law of Idol Worshipping, and he was very strong in the words saying that it is prohibited. And he quoted Deuteronomy 18. Give me the page, Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 14. Deuteronomy 18, verse 14. Page, where is Fran? Thank you. So they said, sentence 9 said, you shall go to your land that the Lord will give you. You shall not do the same of all these horrible nations. Talk to the dead. Communicate with uh, people in different life, in different world. Communicate with people that live before you. Communicate with all these different entities. And then they said in sentence 14, Tamim tiye, you shall be wholehearted with your Lord your God. Because all the other nations that you go to the land, they follow those astrologers and diviners and all kind of things. But you, the Lord your God, um, prohibited you to do it. So the Rambam said, here is a clear source that uh, tells us that it's really a strong um, violation of Torah law. Yet, you see the, the, the Rambam, in his responsa, he basically wrote in one of his books, I'm quoting here, a beautiful article that um, one of the well-known Israeli professors, his name is Yuval Harari, Yuval Harari wrote a book dealing with a Jewish superstition, a Jewish magic. Another one was Dr. Yishai Rosen Tzvi, again, both well-respected scholars in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So he quoted the Rambam himself that wrote a get, like bill of divorce, to all these crazy entities, like uh, names of angels and name of, of demons. And uh, um, he like wrote a special um, amulet that um, demand those entities to disappear from our midst. So in a way you can ask a question which is a different subject. It appears, at least on the surface, obviously it's not, but it appears that the Rambam contradicted himself. Um, in short, the common answer I read from the great Rabbi Ratzon Arusi, who was a candidate to be the chief rabbi of Israel, and uh, he said that if you learn it in order to understand what they are doing, then it's a different story. I remember asking my rabbi, I went to university and college, as you know, for many years, and one of the subjects I study is the comparative religion. So I basically study the main nine world religions. So I study Shintoism, Confucianism for several semesters, Buddhism, Shintoism, um, and more. So Confucianism in China is kind of less, but if you go to different phases of Buddhism or Hinduism, right, um, you see a different form of almost idol worshipping. So he explained to me, look, you study Shintoism, you study Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these different world religions in order to teach and understand when you go to those discussions from interfaith to a different scholarly discussion or comparative religion, you need to know what they believe and what they learn in order to defend your faith and your belief. 
So as much as we inculturated with our own faith, we need to know what others believe. And obviously there are many of our old religions believe still in some form of um, divination of entities, like praying to the certain type of sculpture or certain type of, of entity, and to that entity they'll be able to reach the highest being. Right? I don't want to elaborate too much, but the idea of Rabbi Arutzi explained that if a person does that in order to defend our faith, and again, that person is already learned enough, all the basic foundation of Jewish faith, that's totally different. But as we said, it's a very fine line between uh, believing that, following that, or... or um, um, just learning that in order to understand what it's all about. So, as we said, as far as the Jewish magic, especially if you go to Middle Ages, but not only, it is there, it is there, and the Jewish people used it a lot. As far as the um, practical way, in general, the Torah prohibited us. But you see, if you go by those archaeological evidence, so many, they show that it was a lot of amulets uh, that people use. Um, uh, take, for example, um, uh, the Israelis, you go to the um, Hebrew University Museum or the Israeli National Museum. You see there from Cairo, from Geniza of Cairo. Have you ever heard about it? So in Cairo, there is a lot of evidence of um, using in the ancient time certain, some form of, of divination or some form of using formula to fight against demons, against um, all kind of crazy entities. So as we said, it is part of our culture, yet we said that we oppose it. You take the, uh, uh, the scroll of Qumran, for example, or you take the Dead Sea Scroll, you take the, um, the contradiction with the Karaites, the famous um, disputation between the Sadducees and Karaites, uh, you read the Heichalot literature of Kabbalah, you see all of that is back and forth, back and forth, how far. i give you another vignette. The Rambam in the Guide for the Perplex goes at length to explain that if a person carry an emulat in his pocket, it's not me, but imagine. So the question is, do you allow to carry it on Shabbat? Because you know, by the strict rules, you can't carry on Shabbat if there's no Eru, which is another subject. The Rambam said, if you believe in that, and it's part of your body, part of your clothing, so you can go ahead, he quoted from the Talmud and other sources, you can carry it on Shabbat, because in a way it's the same as carrying your shirt. Can you imagine? So uh, again, in one hand, you see in the Talmud so many sources that said strongly you should not do that. On the other hand, you see people does that. I saw a guy, for example, go to court and carry mezuzah on his hand while he was talking to a judge. I said, why are you doing that? And his answer was, don't you know that that's a protection? So I said, if you say the truth, so God protected you. If you don't say the truth, so you don't say the truth. He said, it gives me a confidence when I carry the mezuzah when I go to court. But again, it's almost like a Jewish psyche that goes in the, in the mind of a person. I see in your faces, you like to talk to me and ask me questions. So I will say this, let me speak for another two, three minutes. Then we take a break, we eat, and if you have questions, I'll gladly answer. I would like to um, use, number one, a book written by an absolutely great scholar. It was, his name is Professor Israel Tashma. It's one of the Israeli, very, very respected, uh, I don't like to use the word secular because he was kind of traditional, but he wrote a book called Hanigleshe Banistar, things that reveal to us with the all hidden information, hidden text. So he explains in numerous examples that Zoharic literature, you know, the Zohar, the great many books of Kabbalah, which again, it's a big question if it was the second century Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai or 13th century Rabbi Moshe de Leon. But regardless, there is a lot of stuff, a lot of things relate to this belief. So in short, 
um, pushing and said food, 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 obviously it's not Jewish. It's hard for me to say the word prohibited, but obviously it's not in the spirit of Jewish faith. We don't do that, right? Um, to say poo 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 for a little baby that born, right? It's nice y uh, Yiddish expressions. I don't see a bad things to say it, but the real connection between reality and this, meaning um, don't look too much on this baby because you give him or her eye in horror. Oh, all of you nod your head. I can't believe I thought I'm talking to myself. Nobody believed me. So. Again, it's, it's really depend upon the Jewish psyche. How do you take it? Or how do you think? But if I go a little more serious is, um, there are people who go to a gravesite, especially gravesite of people who are really righteous during the lifetime, and you see them almost prostrate themselves on the grave and pray. In some places they, they write something and leave the names on the graves. You look at me like I'm from Mars, but it's not. It's real. Do you agree with me? I see some of you nod your head. It's real. I don't want to mention where and when and how, but you know what I'm talking about. I'm not here to say anything bad. God forbid. God forbid. It's not my job. But we need to know where it's coming from. So some rabbi said it's come from the idea the, to the, um, the Torah described Caleb it was 12 spies. We read last week, right? About the 12 spies. And one of them was Caleb. Joshua and Caleb was two spies that basically remained positive about, you know, the report about the Holy Land. So Caleb went and prayed at the graveside of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and asked God for protection against the counsel of the ten spies. So some rabbis hold that that's the source of this minag, of this tradition for some people who go and cry out of all the life problem and please so, is that right or is that wrong? In very, very short, it is right and wrong. What does that mean? Righteous person, if he or she were righteous in the lifetime, the rabbi said, obviously, there is a Jewish belief in the afterlife. There is a Jewish belief that the spirit never die. Yet, we also believe that we are prohibited, the Torah said it in Deuteronomy, very clearly, that we're not allowed to speak to the dead we are prohibited to communicate with the dead. So the way that one can do it, the rabbis instructed us, if you visit that site and you said, Almighty God, here is a burial site of a person whom he or she were total righteous throughout their lifetime. I ask you, God, I'm praying to God, right? God, because of their merit, because of their act of righteousness throughout their lifetime, Please help me with my needs, that's okay. As long as you're not praying to the dead, as long as you not communicate with the dead, you communicate with God. That's the big difference and it's important to know. Also, it's important to know that um, the, in the Jewish concept of communicating with the dead, communicating with the dead, it's, um, it's a long, 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 um, uh, history of people does that. Even the book of like Zohar describes it a lot. So in, in short, before we taking a break and eating and asking questions, here is the answer in short. Poo poo poo, can I a horror, right? Is good and bad. It's good in a sense of feeling good about something and wish something. It's bad in a way if it's a, some act of superstition. So we said that, yes, we believe that there is a capability to do all kinds of things with all kinds of entities. Yet we very strongly believe, especially as observant Jews, which I believe somehow everyone here have some level of observance, that through our prayer, through our charity, through our act of kindness, to our teshuva, tefillah, tzedakah, all these great things that we talk on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we'll be able to overcome all those bad entities. So as far as the Jewish muzzle and the bad muzzle or good muzzle and all these things, who am I to answer those questions? But as far as they um, believe in that, there is something there. 
there is something there, there is something there because even the simple reason is a special weekly portion, we're going to read two weeks from now, about the man that was that close to curse the Jewish people and cause them the total annihilation. So it's something there, yes. It's something that we should practice, no. It's something that we believe, yes and no. We should believe that it's existed, but we also should believe that if we do the right thing, then the Almighty protected us. In short, the rabbi tells us, we are me'al hamazal, we are above the mazal, which means if you're doing the right thing, that's part of our belief, God protected us that all these harm things that, that around us will be able to overcome with good deeds. Now we're about to eat and hear questions, so let's do that.